Song of Solomon. Uh, what I'm going to do these next just few weeks, very spend a brief amount of time on something uh, that I've been told as a pastor, you, you ought to preach on a few things once a year at least, just to keep these things in our forefront and remind us of these things. And one of those things is marriage. So today we're going to look at marriage and what the Bible says about that. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at parenting, uh, because that's something we just always need reminders about. And uh, then the week after that, the Lord willing, we'll look at finances, because these are just issues that all of us face daily uh, and just things that we ought to be grounded solidly in what the Bible says. Uh, so we're going to look today at Song of Solomon to talk about marriage, and we're going to Think about what a Hebrew love song can teach us about marriage. And here's why we want to look at a Hebrew love song. Uh, because in this world, I would say, as I look at the coming generation and even the generation before me, when it comes to the issue of love, pop culture has influenced us almost more than anything else. I mean, what are most all the songs written about? especially country music, right? Love, lost love, right? Uh, but so much, is, it's all about love, right? The Beatles said, love is all you need, right? All you need is love. Uh, every show, every story has some sort of element of romance in it. And I know from my own life, growing up, my concepts of how a man wooed a woman and and you know, how a man felt good about himself was dependent on the kind of woman that loved him. And love was like the theme of every movie you watch. You know, it kind of gets down to, oh, love. And there's always some sort of love story. And every sitcom is about love. And there's so much out there about love. We need to counteract that with what the Bible says about love. So I decided to use a song, the Song of Solomon, because that is what the book is about. And on top of that, I love preaching on Hebrew poetry. Uh, so I'm going to move you through a, a large portion of this song uh, so that you can see this song that you probably have not heard too many sermons on it, right? Uh, this was one of the last series I preached before I left Rome. Uh, but other than that, I had growing up never heard a sermon on Song of Solomon except from my mentor who taught me to love Hebrew poetry. He's the only one that I ever heard preach on it. How many of you have heard a, a sermon on Song of Solomon or a series? Good. Some of you have. Yeah, my family. So, uh, <laughs> But that's good. It's part of the Bible, folks, right? The trouble is we don't know what to do with it. We say, well, maybe it's about Jesus and the church. The trouble is, was the church existing in the time Song of Solomon was written? No. And if you're a good dispensationalist, you believe the church was a mystery that wasn't revealed in ages past. You know, those who are premillennial, pre-tribulational, we believe the church was revealed under the New Testament, that it wasn't there. So it's not about Jesus and his church, because what would Israel have done with this book for you know, hundreds of years until Jesus came? They just have this book where they, oh, I don't know what to do with it. It's some great love story. No, this is a story about marriage and how marriage develops. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about that. Now, this message also is for everyone. So just because you're not married or you've been married in the past and you're not anymore or you have no intention of getting married, all of us know somebody who, who is married. All of us have influence by people who are married or influence over people who are married. And some of us might want to get married someday. Some of us are married. So this book is for everyone, right? The, the word of God is there so that we can correct our thinking. So that's what we want to do today. Kind of use the word of God to correct our thinking. Now, I should have preached this, I suppose, around Valentine's Day, right? But instead, I'm preaching it on Memorial Day. Uh, but that just... That's what happens when you preach straight through passages of the Bible. So uh, in order to prepare us for this book, I want to go over some uh, features of Hebrew poetry first. And you'll notice on your notes, I didn't leave any blanks because I had so much, I didn't want to overwhelm you. 
So I gave you pretty much the whole outline of this sermon, and you can just fill in some extra stuff if you want. Now, the kids are all thinking, they're looking at this saying, there's no blanks. This is all filled in. I've got my candy made for me. Easy. Well, joke's on you. The candy's all the cheap stuff that's left over right now, right? We haven't, we haven't replenished it with the chocolate yet. So. Uh, but yes, your notes are already filled out. So here are some features of Hebrew poetry. Uh, I don't know, this thing isn't working. Can you advance to the slide? If we advance to the next slide, we'll go through these features. The first feature, and many of you have your notes in front of you, parallelism with intensification. Okay, What do I mean by that? Well, we've talked about parallelism a lot in talking about the Psalms, right? Uh, to me, one of the easiest examples to think of is Psalm chapter 1 uh, that says... Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and the night. So Hebrew poetry kind of sounds like it's saying the same thing, but it sharpens or intensifies in the the next line. So you have uh, standing in the counsel of the ungodly, or walk not, what did I say? Walking standing, sitting, right? Uh, Hebrew poetry works this way. So if you can look, here's an example. Song Song of Solomon 2, verse 5, it says this. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. Okay. (laughs) So what is this saying? Well, it's parallelism, right? You've got the the person speaking here uh, with two... (laughs) Uh, Verse 5 would be the Shulamite woman. She's saying, sustain me with cakes of raisins. And then something similar to that is refresh me with apples. So see the parallelism? Sustain, refresh, and then cakes of raisins, apples. So you have a verb that kind of shows I need sustenance. And then you have an object of that verb that is a food. So... See, there's parallelism. This is how Hebrew poetry works, where you, in a sense, you say the same thing, but you intensify it, because the second half is more intense than the first. Simply sustaining with cakes of raisins, more intense than sustaining someone is being refreshed, right? So if you're in a desert, you might get sustained by little drops of water that you find, uh, you know, on a leaf or something in the dew, and you drink that, and that kind of gets you a little further on. But if you have a whole bottle of water, you are refreshed, right? So sustained, refreshed is more intense. Ah, refreshing. Uh, Cakes of raisins, apples. I I don't know the nuance of cakes of raisins and apples. Uh, One, are apples more intense than raisins? I suppose raisins are dried up, right? (laughs) But then even the added phrase, for I am lovesick. So here's why uh, the person speaking needs the sustenance. They're sick with love right now. Okay, So the second half is more intense than the first. So parallelism, you find that in poetry. Here's another huge thing about poetry. Poetry expresses rather than explains. Okay, And here's how we know this. You, you could write a book of the Bible to explain marriage. Paul, in certain verses here and there, talks about marriage, right? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Peter talks about how uh, husbands need to dwell w- with their wives according to knowledge. Song of Solomon is all about marriage, and it is just this whole song that's kind of this celebration Uh, really kind of a dramatic play, like a musical, about marriage. So poetry takes something and celebrates it and looks at all angles of it and uses all these word plays about it. Just like when we, uh, our last sermon series, right? What was the whole point of that? Well, it was all about God is to be worshipped in his place. That place in Israel's time was Jerusalem, right? Now, I explained that to you. But Psalms 120 to 134 expressed it to you, right? In singing things like, 
how beautiful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, or I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's expression rather than explanation. So those of us who don't love poetry, who, who don't, who aren't as expressive, who, who you know, like, uh, you know, reading dictionaries uh, for fun or who, who uh, like using owner manuals and actually reading all of it before you build something. This might not be as exciting to you, but when you can get the mechanics, look at this. I'm trying to give you the mechanics of how to understand poetry. Sometimes that's all people need to enjoy poetry better. And that's actually how I approach poetry. I'm not some guy that loves flowery language, uh, but I'm someone that appreciates the mechanics of poetry. And so that's what I'm explaining to you, uh, that poetry expresses rather than explains. Now the next thing about poetry, you see it all over the place. Poetry uses word imagery, right? It uses pictures to evoke in your mind, express in your mind, not just explain, but really move you to something. Look at Psalm or Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. How fair are you? Here's how fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like the flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing, every one of them which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Now, the trouble is with word imagery is sometimes it doesn't connect with us culturally, right? How many husbands have used this line on a girl or on your wife? Your hair is like a flock of goats. You know, I, I avoid that, you know. Don't say, well, it's biblical to call my wife an old goat, right? No, don't do that, okay? Or you have dove's eyes. We use expressions like that. Dove's eyes, that's not too bad, right? Uh, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. Okay, it's bright white, you know, because it doesn't, the nice thing about shorn sheep, let's think about it, you know, the muddy, whatever, the, the wool's gone, the wool that has anything in it, and you just see that bright white. You ever seen a sheep be shorn? You know, go to State Fair and watch it. It's a fun thing. But it's bright and white, so this guy's c complimenting her teeth. But then he just goes off into poetic bliss by talking about not only are your teeth like shorn sheep these are sheep here's how great these sheep are uh, they are sheep coming up from washing all of them have twins that's how fertile these sheep are they're wonderful sheep perfect sheep I mean he's just going on and on and on it's like all right I get it I've got good teeth thank you yeah. but imagery that's what's used in poetry so we're going to look at this poem today and follow the imagery and try to gain some lessons on marriage for those married, for those unmarried, for those looking to be married, and for those of us who aren't, uh, just to learn what the Bible says about marriage. All right? So let's go back to verse 1, Song of Solomon. Some versions title this Song of Songs, and that is really the title of the song. Uh, if you look at verse 1, it says this, The Song of Songs which is Solomon's, okay? So that can mean it's pertaining to Solomon. It could mean it's by Solomon. It could mean it's about Solomon. It could mean it's written by Solomon. You know, that, that's what of, uh, which is Solomon's, that whole construction can mean many things. But I want to focus in on the very first words, the song of songs. When you say the something of something in the Bible, that means it is the greatest, the epitome of that thing, right? So when we say Jesus is king of kings, where does that put him in the ranking of kings? The highest king there is, right? When we say in the temple there was the holy of holies, what does that mean about that place? It's the holiest place in that whole temple. So if we're talking about the song of songs, that formula means it is the greatest of all songs in the Bible. Imagine that. 
God values a song about marriage as the greatest song in the Bible. If it were up to me, you know, I were, I were choosing a song, I might choose in Isaiah, there's the servant songs, like Isaiah 53 that talks about Jesus, the suffering servant. Maybe I'd choose the song of Moses in Exodus 15, where the horse and rider are thrown into the sea because God has done mightily. Or I might choose Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, that Moses teaches Israel about uh, how God is their rock and has done these great things, yet they're going to turn away from him. Or maybe I'd choose, probably I'd choose Psalm 2, which is my favorite psalm of probably my favorite book, book of the Bible. So Psalm chapter 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a, a vain thing against the Lord and his anointed? And all of this, God says, here's the greatest song in the Bible. It's a song about a marriage that works appropriately. It's a song about a man and a woman. So God values marriage. That's what this shows us. This shows us some application points. Marriage, though temporary, re remember this about marriage, right? Marriage is temporary. It, we, when we make vows, it's till death parts us. Uh, marriage ends at death. There's no marriage in the resurrection. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 30. But marriage, even though it's temporary, it's good and it's to be celebrated. So out of that celebration, out of the fact that God calls marriage the greatest song of all the Bible, another application, marital intimacy is good in God's eyes. It's not something to be embarrassed about. Okay? We need to celebrate this. I don't know if you remember, but when we recently adopted a statement for our church constitution, uh, for our articles of faith, excuse me, our articles of faith, we, uh, you know, we talked about defining marriage as a man and woman, and we talked about gender and how we believe God gives you that, you are born with that. But within that statement on marriage, we, the leadership team, purposefully wanted to say that marriage is a good thing. And that sexual intimacy is a good thing. Folks, God made it, right? That's how God made for the earth to be propagated. Intimacy between a husband and wife. Now, that doesn't mean we need to be crass and talk about it all the time in all kinds of mixed company. That's making light of marriage. But it is something to be celebrated about and not to shy away from and have kind of Victorian ruffle my feathers if you ever say uh, that kind of thing in church. You know, that's why I, I, I'm afraid that Song of Solomon hasn't been preached in church enough because we don't grasp uh, this idea that marital intimacy is great in the eyes of God. Hebrews 13.4 says the marriage bed is to be celebrated. It's undefiled. It's beautiful to God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.2 talks about how a man and wife should have one another. Husband and wife should have intimacy with one another. And you know what? It says nothing about having children. It's not necessarily the whole point. Now, yes, children come from that union, uh, but even when the children are gone and when the ability to have children is gone, that doesn't mean marital intimacy must stop. It's something to be celebrated. Now, this shows us as well, though, that marriage, that, that intimacy is within the bounds of marriage. This book will show us that. But I want to give you the gospel today, the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture. He rose again, and he's ascended to the right hand of God. And if you have failed at this in life, there is forgiveness. Take hope in the gospel. Okay, Your life isn't dependent on whether you have followed the rules or have broken them. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There is forgiveness if you have partaken of and been involved in sexual intimacy outside of the bonds of marriage. There's forgiveness. Embrace that gospel forgiveness and know that everything I preach today, it all starts with the gospel at its base. That Jesus Christ died for sinners. And Song of Solomon is about two sinners coming together. All right? And there's a lot to figure out when, when, when two sinners try to come together and do anything. Now, here's what Song of Solomon is. It's a kind of poetic play with various characters in it. 
Uh, we're not going to spend too much time talking about this, but there's a woman who is a Shulamite. That co- means she comes from this certain region. There is her beloved, and then there's other players within this book, and your Bible kind of sets those apart. There's the daughters of Jerusalem, which kind of act like this giddy girls chorus within the book. They just love love, and they're twitter pated and they're celebrating her love throughout the whole book. And then some of my favorite characters in this book are the brothers of the Shulamite woman. These poor brothers and what they put this girl through, they're typical brothers. You who have brothers who are females, you will understand uh, what this girl goes through when it comes to her brothers. So with that in mind, let's start by talking about insecurity that you find in the book. Because you find insecurity in the lives of husbands and wives and within marriage and in starting trying to have a relationship and navigate all the ins and outs of a relationship. Insecurity is huge. So let's go to Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 4. The woman starts out by saying, let me back up to verse 2. Here's my life verse, not really. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, uh, for your love is better than wine. I love verse 2. It has two things that Baptists don't talk about, kissing and wine. (laughs) Verse 3, because the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Uh, Therefore, the virgins love you. Verse 4, draw me away. It's interesting. This woman starts out, she's kind of in love with the idea of love. And the first thing she asks to be done is to be drawn away. Okay? Uh, she wants to leave her home. And we find that is the case with many young people. Sometimes people look at marriage as, let me get out of here. Start my new life. Folks, m- especially young people, marriage is not a good way to leave your home. Thinking, I will leave all the problems that I don't like here by going and being married. Okay? That is, marriage is never a solution to a problem in that sense. Thinking you will escape some harsh, bad thing in your past by get fleeing toward marriage, that's not going to happen. You bring with you your past into your marriage. And husbands and wives, you don't even know all the things, all the expectations you bring in with you in the marriage, right? So don't think marriage is a way to flee my past and escape. Understand that when you marry someone, you marry a history. You marry a family, okay? And you marry into something, of a very connected network of people, You're not just marrying an individual that you like and admire. You're marrying a whole bunch of things, okay? Uh, We have family that is married uh, to, or or Suzanne has a sister that's married into a family of farmers. And boy, when you marry into farmers, you marry a family, right? And perhaps Suzanne's other siblings could say, Suzanne married a pastor. Boy, she's married a church, you know? In, in the very least, she married a belt, and there's a lot that goes on with that, right? You marry into a whole network of things. Don't think marriage is your way to be drawn away from a past that you don't like. It's a good lesson for young people, okay? So she has this insecurity. She wants to be drawn away. Now, look what she says in verse 5. I am dark, but lovely. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. Like the curtains of Solomon, do not look at me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. She's insecure about her appearance because she's tan. Okay? This is the ancient Near Eastern world where if you're tan, that means you're out in the fields working. Right? It doesn't mean, in our day and age, tanning means... You're this lady with a lot of money who might live in California, somewhere beautiful, and you're, you know, wearing uh, bathing suits all the time, so you're all tan because you're out in the sun living the life of leisure. It's the exact opposite in the ancient Near Eastern world. We knew this, too, growing up. Or, or our first ministry was with uh, a church that was half black, half white, and the black people even had 
uh, variations of how black somebody was. Oh, he's, he's a light-skinned brother or he's a dark brother. And they always valued lighter-skinned. Uh, it was just kind of a symbol of you're not in the sun as much, you're not working, you are more luxurious. So she is saying, I'm tan. Don't hate me because I'm tan. You know, now a lot of girls would be, think the exact opposite. Don't hate me because I'm pasty. You know, I would fit in in this culture much more. Uh, but she, she, notice she tans. She doesn't burn like I do. I'm dark, but I'm lovely. And, and who is it that's giving her a hard time? Her mother's sons. Well, what are your mother's sons? Your brothers, right? This is just a poetic, it's called a circumlocution. You're just kind of talking around the word, but it's her brothers. And boy, these brothers are mean. Uh, we're going to see in a moment here. But she starts out insecure about her appearance because she has worked the fields all the time. Now, her brothers are even going to contribute to these insecurities. Oops, I'm not following along here in my notes. Her brothers are going to contribute to her insecurities because they made her work the fields all the time. But what happens is she progresses through the assurance that her beloved gives her. She gets to this point at the end of the book. So let's go to chapter 8, verses 8 to 9, where her brother's insults mean nothing to her. And maybe I'm juvenile, but I just love the, this verse, and I think it's funny. Okay. The brothers are speaking here in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 8. It's the word of God. So uh, we have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she's spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build upon her a, a battlement of silver. And if she's a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. So isn't this nice? Her brothers are saying, she's flat and we got to gussy her up if she's ever going to get married. What nice boys, right? You know, those of you who have brothers maybe can relate to this. So at the end of the book here, her brothers are trying to put her down. But look at verse 10. Look at her answer. She doesn't whine about them. Verse 10, I am a, wa I am a wall. She's like, fine, I'll take it. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. <laughs> then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Okay. So she stands before her beloved and says, I find peace with you because in your eyes, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful. I don't have to worry about my miserable brothers. They can call me a wall, fine. I'm a wall with two towers protruding. You know, This is definitely sibling rivalry going back and forth. Uh, you've probably never heard a, a sermon about this kind of thing on a Sunday, have you? But, hey, it's in the Bible, right? So how does she get from, I'm dark, uh, you know, I'm tan, I'm not pretty, I am pretty, but just please take me even though I'm tan, to a wall, you say, brothers? I am a wall and I've got towers. How does she get from that point to that point? Well, the way she gets there is through the assurance that her beloved gives her. That's what it's all about. It's about the man taking the initiative and saying, you are beautiful. You are not a wall, you know, that needs to be adorned. You are beautiful, my love. So let's look at a few of these. Maybe we'll uh, not look at all of them just for lack of time. But Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping on, upon the hills. Uh, my beloved is like a gazelle or like a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Okay. So remember, she wants to be drawn away. She wants to leave. And what does her beloved do? He invites her. Okay. The man is taking initiative, inviting the woman. He's making her know, yes, I want you. Okay? He, he's not playing cat and mouse. You know, uh, if you watch like, sitcoms uh, from the 90s, there's always this debate about after a date, 
you had to wait like a certain amount of days before you called because you didn't want to seem too desperate. You know, there's all these foolish games we play in dating, right? And boy, am I glad that I am not trying to find a mate in the age of cell phones. Oh my goodness. I I'm so thankful I didn't have cell phones when I was, they had them when I was dating Suzanne, but we didn't own them. So I didn't have to worry about like, oh, I texted her and she didn't text back. And oh, what does that mean? Or, or she only texted okay when I said I love you or you know, all that kind of stuff. All the insecurities of this world. I'm so glad I don't live in the age of cell phones. But this woman wants to be drawn away. And what is the proper response to the man? Come, an invitation. So the man invites her. He wants her to come. He's pursuing her. Chapter 4, verse 1 uh, again, he assures her, Behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair. Okay, uh, verse 7. You are fair, my love, and there is no spot on you. Verse 8. No, you, you should go through this book and notice how many times the lover, the beloved, invites her. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Okay, so he's inviting her, inviting her all throughout the book. He's inviting her all the way to chapter 8. We finally get to 8 when she's all confident in who she is. Chapter 8, verse 5 says this, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? Okay, So we have this invitation, come, come, come. Well, now she is coming, and what's she doing? But she's leaning on him. You know, I just imagine him riding a donkey. I guess they can't sit to a cross, but ho however it's working out, she's leaning on him. She's there, she's confident, and she's confident because he has given her that confidence, because he has invited her, because he's taken initiative, because he has assured her of her beauty. Husbands, we need to do that with our wives. Okay. Now also within marriage and within relationship, there is ownership involved. That's what relationships are all about, right? So we see this progression of ownership language uh, throughout Song of Solomon, a progression of ownership language. It shows that she, again, grows in her confidence. Chapter 2, verse 16 says this, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay. So she starts out by saying, I am his, and he's mine. And then she just makes this kind of blanket statement, He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay. So she claims ownership, but then makes a statement about him that doesn't seem to quite connect. Go to chapter 3, verse 5. Again, I'm just painting these broad brush strokes back and forth in the book to show you how the book moves. Uh, whoops, that's not the one I wanted. Sorry. Um, sorry, I jumped ahead in my own notes. Chapter 6, verse 3. She uses the same exact words, right? 6, 3. I am my beloved's. And my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay, so she says the same thing. I am his, he's mine. He does this. Okay, he feeds his flock among the lilies. What you find in the book of Song of Solomon is there is a tension between city life and country life. And country life, the agrarian, back to nature kind of way, that's where the romance takes place. And in the city, distress takes place. That's just a theme in Song of Solomon. We're not going to explore that today. But she uses this terms of ownership, 6-3. Now go to chapter 7, verse 10. Same words, but now there's going to be a twist. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Okay. So you see, by the words that come out of her mouth, she's, again, confidence is being gained. I am my beloved's, my beloved is mine, he feeds his flock among the lilies. I am my beloved's, my beloved is mine, he feeds his flock among the lilies. Then, I am my beloved's, my beloved's desires for me. So do you see, uh, through these two lines of, of uh, thought throughout the book, she grows. Understand, men, your wife or your person you are courting to be your wife, women need to gain confidence, and it can take time, and it takes work on our behalf to cultivate that. Another phrase all throughout this book, imagery, is a garden. We people are like gardens. Gardens need to be tended. They need to be cultivated. They need to be weeded, right? And we've got to do that with our own marriage. You can't just let it sit there, grow stagnant, think it's going to grow and be fine. 
You've got to cultivate it. You've got to pull up the nasty weeds. Get that out of there. You've got to trim things back. You've got to let it grow. You've got to build a trellis so that the vine can grow on it. And, and, and so, uh, my beloved is mine. His desire is for me. She has to have that change of heart that comes from him assuring her. Now, another theme you find that moves throughout this book is this progression in her readiness for marriage. Whoops jumped ahead. This progression in her readiness for marriage. Uh, Go to Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 7. It says this, and here's a phrase we find repeated throughout the book. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Okay. Here's what's going on here. This is oath language. When you have someone that charges you to do something and then says, buy something else. Okay, so I charge you by heaven and earth to do this. You are commanding someone to take an oath. Now, who's being commanded here? The daughters of Jerusalem. These are the other young women looking on, watching this courtship develop. And she says to those women looking on that there needs to be Love needs to be ready for it to actually happen. Love has a progression. She's emphasizing love needs to be ready before you partake of all those things that are part of love. Okay? So really, don't stir up or awaken love. What she means is don't have physical relationships that are stirring up things that shouldn't be there until you are ready. And by ready, we'll see at the end of the book what she means by ready. By ready, she means marriage. She means commitment until death. Okay. What we have today, and maybe you grew up with this, is we have young people pairing off, you know, starting early, early on, you know, and it just saddens my heart to see, you know, 15 year olds holding hands, being all physically intimate with one another when that's just not going to lead anywhere because they have too long before they're going to be married. You know, I would discourage that kind of thing in my children. You don't need to pair off and just, you know, stare deeply into the eyes of some young woman and get physically involved with her unless you know for certain that you are giving your life to that person. And as a teenager, you can't do that. You've got a long time coming, right? Steve Green, in the song, Children Are a Treasure from the Lord, he, he gives great advice. He says, and at 21, we'll let them go on their first date, but of course they'll be at home in bed by eight. Children are a treasure from the Lord. So I, I've always thought that was a good song. Uh, <laughs> but unless love is ready for that lifetime commitment, don't arouse it by literally arousing one another. That's what she's saying. And she doesn't say it just here in the book. She says it again, chapter uh, 3, verse 5. Once again, she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And then she says it again in chapter 8, verse 4. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now, there's one point in this song when she actually kind of steps outside this normal progression, tries to take things into her own hands, and that's in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Twice it happens in her dreams that she goes looking for her lover, and she tries to find him rather than him coming after her. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, By night on my bed I sought the one I love. That means she's dreaming. Uh, I saw him, did not find him. I will rise now. I will go out in the city, in the streets. I'll look for him. Have you seen my love? Uh, Okay, so she does that again in chapter 5, verses 2 to 8. It says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Again, what does that mean? It means I'm dreaming. So she starts looking for her beloved. Uh, I sleep, my heart's awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved has put his hand behind the latch of the door. Uh, I'm going to skip all this. Go down to verse 6. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved has turned away and was gone. 
My heart leaped when he spoke. I sought him but could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. Then she says in 5 verse 8, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, then tell him I'm lovesick. Poor girl. When she goes seeking after him, she can't find him, and she ends in fr frustration. But when he seeks after her, when he encourages her, when he brings her along with him, she feels secure in that, uh, so that love is ready. So chapter 8, verse 4, when it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Here is why that is the case. Go down to verse 6 of chapter 8. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. A seal shows permanence. It's saying, I'm going to be there forever. This is stating, this is a vow, this is who I am. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Johnny Cash was reading uh, Song of Solomon when he wrote, I fell into a burning ring of fire, right? It, it fits, it fits this, right? I, I made that up, but it actually does fit this. He's talking about love, and he knows, yeah, love is like a flame of fire. Think about all the songs out there that talk about love being some sort of flame of fire. And we all know that. Love burns, Right? So here's why you don't arouse and awaken and kind of half-heartedly do love. That's what this hookup culture nowadays does, where it has some of the elements of love, where you sleep with one another and you arouse each other and you have sexual intimacy, but then there's no commitment and then you're gone. You find each other on an app on a phone and then you're gone the next day. You are arousing flames that are as strong as death and you can't quench it, and then you're just going to walk away from it, the Bible warns you that's nonsense, folks, and this dating culture can tell you it's nonsense. They know deep down in their hearts it does nothing. They have to keep it going just to ignore the emptiness that comes through arousing this love. So the reason we don't arouse or awaken love until it pleases is because love has the power of death. And God made us to be people who partner together until death parts us. So that's why we don't arouse these things until we are ready. So we don't go into marriage half-heartedly. We have to know what the commitment is. So just some uh, quick applications about marriage. Unmarried men, take the lead in your relationship and be clear and assuring about what your intentions are. You know, when I was about 16, uh, the popular book at that time was called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And while that author has gone off the rails, he is an apostate now, unfortunately, the concept of that book I still agree with. And that was, I made a commitment back then, I'm not going to date all these women, be, uh, you know, and kind of like single pair off with them unless I'm looking for a wife. So I decided there was no point in doing that in high school. You know, and, and so I had to beat off hundreds of ladies that wanted to date me. Let me tell you, that was a really hard commitment to keep. You know? All the girls in my youth group were saying, oh, wow, must be tough for you, I'm sure, to make such a commitment to not date us. We, we're all, they were crying. You know? I mean, they were just swooning. Is that the word? I mean, they were just so sad. But, honestly, in my own life, I made that commitment. And the first woman I ever dated, single, you know, just me and her, was my wife. And the Lord has blessed that. Uh, I'm not some sort of success story that I'm the best or something, but uh, I just realized from Scripture the principle is I'm looking for a wife. Now, if you're not looking for a wife, you can still have friends with females. Don't make it weird. Like, you know, every woman you ever talk to, are you a wife, are you a wife, are you a wife, you know. Uh, that can be weird too, guys. So take my advice in, in an understanding manner. Married men, assure your wife of your love. And, and there may be many ways to do that, right? 
Have you ever read the book Love Languages? Realize your wife receives love and perceives things of love in different ways than other wives, than other people. You know, does your wife seek verbal praise? Then give that to her. If that's not, if that's not what she loves, does she like gifts? Give that to her. Is that not what she cares about? Does she just want your time, your undivided attention? Then give that to her. Or does she like you serving her? Does she like you doing the dishes? Then do that kind of thing. You have to kind of figure out what assures my wife of love. You know, my wife is not one that loves me to lavish on praise, probably because she's heard 18, almost 19 years of my sarcasm, so she never knows when something's really praise, right? So, you know, we do love differently. We, we communicate it different with one another. Men, figure out your wife, dwell with her according to knowledge, and assure her. Uh, here's one I love. I think the first one I heard say this was John Piper. He said, you can't just say to your wife, I love you, and I'll let you know if that changes. You know, that sounds reasonable and logical to me, right? You know, hey, just by default, know I love you, right? That's my default in life is that I love you. I'll tell you when I don't. No, we have to tell her. My, I tell my wife every day I love her. Uh, w next, wives, look for assurance and fulfillment from your husband. Don't look for attention from other men. That, that is a, a temptation in life that maybe your man isn't giving you that assurance of love and you go find it other places. May maybe you don't ever do anything physical, but you just kind of look for it somewhere else, you know. You, you, you go find some sort of fulfillment and maybe there's nothing physical, but one can have an emotional uh, <clears throat> affair in their hearts. It's not just about the physical. And then lastly, this is for all of us. Sexual intimacy is only for those who have committed to be together until death. Don't arouse in someone that which you can't deliver on. Okay. The arousal that a husband and wife do to one another is there to gel together a relationship till death. That's what sex is about. It's about glue to strengthen this bond of commitment till death. It, it, so reapply that glue as often as needed to keep that bond of commitment there, folks. That is what it's all about. And if you have failed, flee to the gospel. That is your only hope. That is my only hope. Many of us fail at this stuff over and over and over. I'm not saying you're disqualified or live in your misery. I'm saying run to the gospel, receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and pursue whatever station he has you in life. Pursue it with all your heart. That's what it's about. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wife you've given me. I thank you for the direction on marriage that your Bible gives. And I pray that you will strengthen marriages. I pray that you will provide spouses for those seeking them. And I pray that you will help us all to remain faithful to you, Lord, first and foremost. And use our bodies in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen.